Welcome to our series, Science and the Bible. Dr. Guy is a practicing physician, a psychiatrist in southeastern Michigan. In addition to his medical degree from the University of Michigan, he has a PhD in experimental pathology with doctoral minors in clinical biochemistry and pharmacology. He's a former genetics professor at Eastern Michigan University and in the early 1980s worked with Dr. Giles Carter, an ancillary member of the Shroud of Turin Research Project. Dr. Guy is a current member of the Shroud Science Research Group, and he has been speaking on the Shroud of Turin for over 40 years. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Right, well, welcome, everyone. Thank you, and I'm glad you're here this morning. Uh, this is quite an endeavor. Um, I'm, I'm actually quite surprised at the turnout. I, uh, it wasn't my idea, actually. Um, it was very loosely in my idea, rather. Uh, I've been doing these Shroud presentations for about 30 years, and it's not the only thing I talk about. I mean, I, I have done research many years ago on it, and now I, I basically go around and talk about that research and uh, keep up with the research of other people, so I stay abreast of what's going on uh, with, the, with the Shroud of Turn. But predominantly, I, I speak a lot on drugs. I mean, I, 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 I'm a practicing psychiatrist, but I travel around to hospitals and doctor's offices explaining how new drugs work. That's kind of my job. I try to make complicated material simple so that anybody can understand it or, you know, I mean, anybody that needs to use the drugs <laughs> needs to understand how they work, okay? So what I try to do here in my presentation on the Shroud of Turin is take rather complicated material and make it easier to understand. The idea being this. It's one thing to hear an expert say, you know, I really believe that this cloth is genuine and I believe that it was produced by a supernatural process and such and such and so and so. And then you go home and say, well, you know, that smart expert believes that, therefore what? You're gonna believe because an expert said? Sometimes that's okay. However, there are some things that are kind of important and you need to really know for yourself if you believe it or not. And so what I want to try to do is to make these very complicated materials simple enough so that the average person can grasp just how strong the evidence is. So that when you leave this very long program, you don't come away saying, well, look at all those smart experts that believe that it's genuine. I'd like you to actually own this so that you understand why they think that it's genuine. Then it becomes yours. And I think that's really the strength here. That's, that's the strength of this kind of presentation is we have the time to do that. And, and I'm, I'm really impressed with you for coming. Um, when I, 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 I said at a program one time, I used to I usually do an hour program for the Shroud of Turin. I mean, I made it an hour because that's how long most people can sit. So including me, I don't like sitting for more than an hour. I mean, you know, really, especially on technical material. You know, seriously? Um, you know, and so that's why I made it an hour. But I made a comment to Pastor Denson um, after one of my talks that really, the amount of information is available, I could literally talk for five hours and not come to the end because there is so much information. There is so much evidence. And he's like, well, why don't we try it? <laughs> so here we are, <laughs> okay, we're doing it today, okay? Now, it's not exactly, we're, although you're going to be here five hours, I don't speak for five hours, fortunately. Uh, so there are breaks involved, but there's quite a lot of information. So um, why don't we get started here? Um, all right. One of the reasons that it, it's a good idea to do a program like this is, first of all, like I just said, it's good to do a program like this because it's important for you, the audience, to understand why the evidence is what it is. Uh, why the scientists who believe that it's genuine believe that. You want you to see the evidence that they see. The other reason why it's a good idea to get this kind of evidence out is that evangelical atheism is growing in popularity in the West. It's very strong in Europe and growing in strength in the United States. And if you don't know what evangelical atheism is, you may have heard it called the new atheism. And it's different than the old atheism, okay? <laughs> the old atheism that most of us are familiar with basically said, it's okay for you to go to church on Sunday. It's okay for you to take your kids to Sunday school, tell them Jesus loves you, this I know, and all that stuff. That's fine. Just stay out of schools, stay out of government. Okay, we don't want to hear it. Other than that, this is a free country, do as you please. That's the old atheism. The new atheism says, well, let me, let, me, let me just read the definition here uh, from the slide here. 
New atheism, new atheism uh, says, is a belief that religion should not simply be tolerated, but should be countered, criticized, and exposed by rational argument wherever its influence arises. In other words, not only do they not want people to walk around talking about their faith, when you do talk about your faith, uh, they want to make you feel stupid for doing it. They want to make you feel stupid for believing in God. And uh, according to their belief system, people of faith are responsible for many of the world's problems. Okay, one thing you may have heard, for example, is, well, you know, think about all the starving children in the world. There are a lot of kids today who are starving every day. Children starve all around the world. And if we believe in God, and we believe in the Christian God, then all things eventually work out just fine, and in the end, he'll let us all in on the joke. In the meantime, because we believe that in the end he'll let us in on the joke and everything will be just fine, we don't have to worry about those people. So then we feel justified in sitting on our hands because we believe that God will make it all work out and we don't have any responsibility. Now, for those of us who actually have faith and are Christians, we know that that's ridiculous. That's a straw man. That, that there are, that's, that's not really a Christian belief per se. That You're really getting into certain elements of Hinduism when you start going, that, going down that route where people have bad lives because of their karma. We don't believe that. So that's, that's kind of nonsense. But that is kind of where they're going with this. That as a, as a believer in God, you are a bad person and you are a stupid person. And that is not only perpetuated on college campuses, it is also perpetuated now in high schools, and they're going after the junior high and elementary school kids. And it doesn't mean that there's going to be a mass amount of atheism next year, but that's where it's, it's creeping along. And I want to give you, the audience, some ammunition. When your kids come home with this, when you are presented with this stuff, uh, you, you, you need to have a response. Why do we believe in God? Why do, we, why do we believe that Jesus is anything more than he claimed to be? Um, I think that what we'll see in the Shroud lends credibility to his claims or to the claim that he was something more than just a human. All right. Um, now, there are many uh, uh, prophets for the evangelical atheist movement, and uh, we see the slide full of them here. Dennett, Dawkins, Harris, Hitchens, Stanger, and they all pretty much kind of say similar things. They're not all identical. They have different, different positions, but they say very much uh, similar things. Uh, this is a clip from uh, Christopher Hitchens, and um, you'll see it kind of sums up their position on the historicity of Christ pretty well here. In my book, I say that there's no reason at all to believe that uh, the so-called Jesus of Nazareth ever existed. Uh, now, there is, on the historicity point, that there may have been the figure of some kind of deluded rabbi uh, present at that time. You could mention another thing about the resurrection. Most of the witnesses to this are women, illiterate, stupid, deluded, hysterical females of the kind who in a Jewish court at that time would have had about as much chance of being listened to as they would in an Islamic court today. What religion that wants its fabrication to be believed is going to say, you've got to believe it, because we have some illiterate hysterical girls who said they saw this. No, it's impressive to me. It's impressive to me that the evidence is so thin and is so hysterical and is so feeble and is so obviously, strenuously, uh, uh, cobbled together because it suggested there was something was going on there was some character and I don't want to therefore to profane those who think that no uh, there must have been something and say no there was nothing this is not a whole cloth fabrication but it is a very human and very intelligible and very um, pitiable I think uh, 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 practice of fraud uh, that may have worked on stupefied uh, peasants in the Greater Jerusalem area, but should really have no power to influence anyone um, in this room, whereas the noble uh, methods and words and systems by which Socrates reasoned uh, will continue to illuminate our path for as long as we care about the only real gift we have, which is our independent um, so his proposition here is that Jesus was nothing more than a deluded, charismatic preacher who fooled the stupefied residents of the greater Jerusalem area, and he convinced them into believing that he was something more than a charismatic preacher. Okay, um, and the evidence that the Jesus of the, of the that the historical Jesus was anything more than just a man is thin. Uh, he called it hysterical, feeble, and strenuously cobbled together. 
So there is no credible evidence that he was anything more than just basically a deluded wandering rabbi. Now it's interesting, he's not blaming the apostles for lying about their master. He is going back to the person of Jesus Christ. He was a, he's, this is, he was a regular Jim Jones. I mean, that's what he's doing. He's putting him on that level, that he convinced these people that he was something very special. And he successfully pulled it off. They were, they were, they were weak-minded, and he pulled it off. Now, is therefore faith in this risen Lord of the New Testament blind faith or not? Because that's what, what, they're, that's what they're presenting us with. Because there is a difference. These individuals, now many, some of them will go so far as to say that there's no, no, there's no evidence that Jesus ever existed. There was no historical Jesus. There are some that are saying that. But most of them who are a little bit better educated, okay, a little bit, they're saying, well, he existed, but he was nothing like what the New Testament portrays him as. This guy, oh, no, no, there is a big difference between um, the, God, the, the Jesus of the Bible and the Jesus of history. Now, when we call the, we talk, the title of this shroud, this presentation is The Credible Shroud. What is credible? Well, credibility refers to believability. If you are, if you witness an accident or if you witness an event and you are called to testify, the question is, are you a credible witness or not? A credible witness is somebody who, number one, is believable. And believable, believability has to do with the story that you're telling. Are you telling us a, sto a story that's consistent with the facts? And do you normally tell the truth? Do you have any, is there secondary gain involved? So there are multiple, multiple things uh, that go into being credible. Is the shroud a credible witness to the historicity of the Jesus of the Bible? Okay, I mean, is this a credible witness? Is it saying that the Jesus of the Bible, or is it, does it imply that the Jesus of the Bible and the Jesus of history are the same person? The Jesus of the New Testament is unlike really any other character in history, uh, in that when you have characters in history that, to which miraculous feats are, are, are attributed to, um, you, there, you, we question whether they really existed, unless you're talking about maybe somebody like Moses, or I should say outside of the whole Bible situation, because um, certainly in other cultures when you have stories of the gods, they do miraculous things and they defy the laws of nature and physics and so forth. But here, what we have in Jesus of Nazareth is an individual to which the supernatural was attributed on a regular basis. Here was somebody who is walking on water, raising the dead, Curing people who were born blind, bringing back hearing to people who were born deaf, curing leprosy, uh, br uh, raising from the dead himself, and raising other people from the dead. This is what he did on a regular basis. The person of Jesus of Nazareth is characterized by breaking the laws. That's what he did. Yeah, he was, a, he was a rabbi. Oh, great. Well, as a rabbi, what did he teach? Love your neighbor and stuff. Okay. Those are very nice. Most of what he taught, however, was already present in the Torah. Most of it was already present in the Old Testament. What was different about him was the miraculous. So then, the picture that, 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 that Christopher was talking about here is he's saying that this guy was really crafty. And he convinced individuals into, to believe that he was something more than just a person. And he did, apparently did a lot of magic tricks to win them over. Now, the Bible records that the body of Jesus underwent a process called anastasis. That's the Greek word for resurrection. That it was dead, and suddenly it came alive again. Now, question, does the shroud provide credible evidence that the body that it once wrapped underwent some type of naturally inexplicable process? You understand what I mean by naturally inexplicable? It's not explicable by natural means. Okay? Does the shroud provide evidence that something like that took place with the body that it once held? That's a question. And the other question is, okay, does the shroud provide evidence that it contained the body of Jesus of Nazareth? Now, that's a tough one. If you think about it, well, how do you, I mean, you know, it's not like we have pictures of him in the Bible there, okay? How do we verify that? That it's his DNA, you know, I mean, what in the world, how do we know who that was? So those are really the two, that's, those are the two big questions that we need answers to, and that's kind of why we're here. Now, when it comes to opinions on the validity of the, the, the Shroud of Turin, 
there's a bell curve. And as you can see on the slide here, on the one end, you have a lot of people who believe that it is a stupid or clever forgery. Either it's a stupid forgery where anybody from the Middle Ages could have done it, or a clever forgery. Well, somebody on the level of Michelangelo created this thing. But it's clearly a forgery. It was done so that the Catholic Church could make money. Hello, I mean, there's your motivation right there. And they did, okay? So there you go. So that's on the one end. Now, the next step up from that is to believe that it is the genuine burial cloth of somebody, but we don't know who that was. We have no idea who that person in the cloth was. Third possibility, that it's the genuine burial cloth of somebody. And there is some evidence that that person may indeed have been Jesus of Nazareth. Okay? But doesn't, you know, that's as far as you can say. That's as far as it goes. It's the burial cloth of Jesus of Nazareth. Okay? It does appear to be genuine. And it's not a for for forgery. And there are people, there are several of the researchers who actually worked on the Shrove Tour and have that opinion. They are convinced that this is the real burial cloth of Jesus of Nazareth, that it goes all the way back to the first century. Uh, but they do not believe that anything necessarily supernatural happened to that body. That which brings us to the next one. You have individuals who believe that, yeah, it's the genuine burial cloth of Jesus of Nazareth, and it provides evidence for a supernatural event. It provides evidence of a resurrection. And then the next one up from that, and you think there's one up, up yes, there's another one. And the one up from that says, it not only provides evidence, it proves the resurrection. And there's one more. It's called the Holy Shroud. The Holy Shroud is where you believe that not only not only is it the real cloth of Jesus Christ, not only does it prove the resurrection, it has magical powers. It can heal. I mean, if you go there and you have faith and you touch it, you can be healed. So it's, it's like it goes from being nothing like Jesus, being a total forgery, to almost being Jesus itself. And that, those are, the, those are the, the range of beliefs that are out there about this cloth. You are the jury. Think of this like you're going to be hearing um, evidence, uh, prosecution and defense uh, for the authenticity of this cloth, uh, for what I just said, okay, regarding the, uh, the identity of the person in it and whether or not it demonstrates that some, whether or not some supernatural event may have occurred to the body in the cloth. You're going to be hearing this evidence and it's up to you to, to ultimately to make up your mind. But you know, in order to approach evidence, it's, it's important as a jury to understand what makes a good argument. And you might think, well, gee, everybody knows that. I've been arguing all my life, <laughs> right? <laughs> no. Did you see the Casey Anthony trial? Clearly, Americans don't know good evidence, okay? They don't. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm biased, but, you know, for crying out loud, <laughs> okay, they don't. There have been a few trials like that where you go, what were they thinking? Like, you know, so anyway, so there are, it, it, before, if you, if you used to, if you went to, uh, if you had a university education 40 years ago, you had to take logic. That's why it was called university, because you got a universal education. Everybody kind of learned the same things. You understood about Western civilization and logic, and you had to take the same type of math classes and so forth. So you came out of it, you could like meet somebody else who had a college education, and you knew what they knew, because everybody kind of got the same thing, <laughs> okay? But it, it, that's why they called it university. Well, that's, that's another story, but anyway, it, it, was, it was a lot more universal back then. Now, no, the only people who get courses in logic are lawyers. Unless you're going to law school, you don't take logic. Very few people take logic. And so I'm going to just review some basic, basic, uh, basic anatomy of good arguments. Okay, real quick, real quick. All right, what are they? What makes up an argument? Okay, here's an example of an argument. Politicians make lots of money. That's a premise. Another premise, I want to make lots of money. And the third, and the conclusion, I should therefore become a politician. Okay? That's, that's an argument. You've got two premises and a conclusion, and that's the basic anatomy of an argument. Two premises and a conclusion. The premises are what you start with. You know them ahead of time. You are assuming them for the purposes of your argument. And the conclusion is the thing that you can automatically deduce from your premises. If my premises are true, then my, arc, my, my conclusion logically flows from the premises, okay? A simple argument has two premises and a conclusion. And in an argument, the conclusion is only supported by, by two premises, but 
each premises, it can be supported in a number of ways. Because you've got to have support. You can say these things, but well, how do you know your premises are true? How do you know those? You need, to, you, need, you need to have some support for those. So what supports a premise? Supporting arguments, assumptions, evidence, authority, and explanations and anecdotes. And I'm going to go through each of these. Okay, supporting arguments. What are supporting arguments? Supporting arguments basically are other arguments that say the same thing as the conclusion you're, you're, getting, you're, you're getting at. Uh, for example, um, a supporting argument would be like, employers should allow employees to access Twitter and Facebook at work. Okay, like where I work, you try to get Facebook, guess what? <laughs> no, not allowed, that's not, <laughs> not, you're not supposed to be doing that at work, okay? All right, a supporting argument to that is they have, they can use their phones anyway. We got smartphones, hello. It's not like we can't get there. So whatever, okay? That's a supporting argument, okay? It doesn't prove that they have to make us, let us use Facebook at work. But anyway, that's just a supporting argument. Right, another example of supporting argument, easy credit promotes obesity. Easy credit promotes obesity. And a supporting argument is that 86% of American grocery store purchases are made with credit cards. Now, it doesn't prove it, but that's a supporting argument. It's another argument that says the same thing, that easy credit promotes rising obesity. All right, now what's, now what's another one? Okay, that's supporting arguments. The other one is assumptions. Assumptions are basically common sense things, all right? Why are you wearing a belt? The assumption is you kind of want to hold your pants up. I mean, that's just common sense type of deal, okay? That's an assumption. So you're, you're, you're relying on common sense. It's very hard nowadays because common sense is becoming less common. But regard, you know, regardless, those, we, we, that's, that's, historically that has been used as support. They are self-evident truths, not really in need of further support or analysis, okay? The sky is usually blue. All right, that's self-evident, all right? Most people know that, but you'll find somebody who's really good at sophistry who'll just blah, blah, blah. And anyway, <laughs> what if you're blind? You know, oh my gosh, anyway. All right, evidence, uh, that's the other, the other support for that, um, for, for uh, a premise. Now, e uh, evidence takes the form of, uh, there's an acronym, SHEEP is the acronym uh, that we use for that. S stands for statistical studies, uh, H, historical information, E, experiments, E, eyewitness accounts, and P, physical evidence. So those are forms of evidence. And we're going to be, when talking about evidence for this whole shroud thing, I'm going to be referring to multiple lines of evidence. So just keep that in mind. And uh, next is authority. And again, with the shroud too, we're going to be referring to a lot of people uh, whose authority verifies various aspects of, of, of evidence here. But authority, we refer to authority when the information is so complicated that most people aren't able to fully understand it. For example, when you bring on an expert on fingerprints in a criminal trial, most of us don't know how to read fingerprints, okay? Most of us can't tell, you know, whether these are, are the same or different. It's, it would take us a long time. There are people who are trained in that, and so we put them on the witness stand and say, well, are they the same or not? And we depend on expert testimony. Okay, and last is explanations and anecdotes, and we do a lot of that today. That's really the purpose of today's talk. Explanations and anecdotes is where you can take rather complicated data, complicated observations, and break it down and explain it to the jury so that they can understand, in terms that they can visualize, they can understand what you are saying. And when they understand it, they can make better choices, and that is evidence. And so it's not really new kind of evidence, but it's the kind of evidence because you're taking the data that's there and you are clarifying it so that they can own it. That's what we're doing here today. All right. So, the Shroud of Turin. This is inarguably the most studied artifact in human history. There is no competition. King Tut has nothing on the Shroud of Turin. Okay, even Hitler was obsessed by the Shroud of Turin. This is a very, very, very studied artifact. No other artifact has had more money or man hours of study than this. None. There is no competition. Okay. Um, now, as we, as, if you become a student of the Shroud of Turin, you will have to grow in knowledge in history, chemistry, physics, pathology, biology, botany, textile technology, philosophy, and religion. When you study the Shroud of Turin, you become a student of science. 
Um, I started studying this back when I was in college, and I will say it actually shaped my career in a lot of ways. Um, I didn't, there were subjects I didn't think that I liked, and when I got into studying Strand of Turin, I found that I did, and it actually altered my career. I think one of the reasons I became a radiologist is when I was looking at image formation uh, processes for the Shroud of Turin, I developed an interest in physics. You know, I, I really didn't like it that much. I had to take it as it was pre-med, but I didn't really like it when I took it the course. But then when I studied, when I was looking at the Shroud and had to learn more about this to understand image formation techniques, it made me, it made me go in that direction, okay? I mean, it actually changed the course of my life. There is a lot of stuff here. And um, there, is ver there are very few sciences that study of the Shroud of Turin does not touch upon, okay? Maybe not hydraulics, you know, you don't learn anything about that, but other sciences are all there. All right, the Shroud of Turin is 14 and a half feet long and three and a half feet wide. Uh, and pressed on one side of the cloth only, or predominantly on one side of the cloth only, are the front and back images of a man's body. Now what you see here is a mylar transparency of the negative of the shroud, okay? And we're gonna talk about that shortly. But this gives you an idea as to how tall it is. Um, by the way that it was impressed on the cloth, we can see that this is the way it wrapped around the body. Uh, it kind of was open at the feet, and it wrapped all around the head and the front, and it came around back there. And here you see um, the, the way that it appeared in the sheet. And what you notice from this particular slide is that the, the body rigor mortis appears to have set in. Okay? And so that when the body was in the cloth, it wasn't, it wasn't laying flat. And a lot of people have criticized the man in the shroud saying, oh, come on, a child drew that guy because the arms are too long, the legs are too short. And I'm like, okay, hold it, all right. He wasn't laying flat. Do you understand what that means when you're not laying flat? His head, look at the slide. He was bent. When you're, hang, when you're hanging on the cross like that and you die and you're like this for like three hours, what happens after three hours of being dead? Rigor mortis, that's what it's called, rigor mortis, right? Okay, you're laying there and you're bent forward, your knees are bent because your, na your, your toes are nailed and so you're doing like that. You take him out of the cross, he's still boing, 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 he's still doing that. You gotta tie him down to keep the arms from going back up. He's still bent forward. And so the body, because it's bent forward, whatever the image formation process was, it foreshortens the torso it alters the, the, more, the, the, the dimensions of the legs, and so that's why some of these, these changes are there. And so then you take a look at the image up here, that gives you some idea as to the way the, the way the body was laying in the cloth. Now, we don't exactly know how tall he was. Well, why not? Because it's written on linen, for one thing. If it was written on stone, we'd have a better idea. But it's written on linen. Linen changes with humidity, okay? Not only that, not, we don't know what the original size was, okay? Not only that, he was bent. The rigor mortis was in, so we don't know how bent he was. We have no way of knowing exactly how bent his legs were or how forward his torso was. We can only guess, okay? We have a range. Therefore, we can say he was probably somewhere between five foot 11 and six foot two, all right? That, that's, as, that's, as, that's as good as we can get. And here we see a picture of a six-foot person standing next to the cloth, all right? And this is kind of life-size, and so you see me, not quite six feet, standing next to it, so see how big it is anyway. <laughs> all right. Now, according to uh, Mark Antonacci, he wrote a book, and I agree with some of the things that he says in it, um, and uh, he wrote a book, and he describes in his book called The Resurrection of the Shroud, multiple facets of the body of the man, the Shroud, which suggests that he was of Jewish origin. Um, he explains that his physiognomy is Jewish. Now, what is physiognomy? Physiognomy refers to facial features. Whoever invented that word, I don't know what they were thinking. Physiognomy, five syllables. Facial features, four syllables. Seems like a waste of words. Anyway. Um, his hair, uh, the part in his hair, the length of his hair, the fact that there appears to be a pigtail, and, and the three-dimensional pictures, you can, you can appreciate that more. You can actually see the hair coming out back there. He has the pigtail, and his beard follow traits of Jewish men of the first century. Um, the hair straight at the root and becoming more curly toward the ends is common among Jews. Uh, the man of the shroud's beard and forelocks are traditional, even today among some Orthodox Jews. Um, the, the, the close eye-nose correlation and the protuberance of the left side of the nose are typical of Semitic ancestry, as are the high cheekbones. 
He appears to have a chin band around his jaw, which makes, makes his hair kind of bunch forward. So we're talking about a chin band that goes around the head like this, making the hair kind of poof forward a little bit there. Uh, the burial posture matches skeletons found in Kerbet Qumran, which is a Jewish community of, from the first century. And that's how they buried their dead, in the same position that we see the man in the shroud. Um, unlike, there was, uh, uh, Josh McDowell wrote a book many years ago, um, uh, uh, Evidence That Advanced Verdict, the first issue that came out, and he, he mentioned that Jesus may have been wrapped in strips like a mummy. Okay, uh, we, there is no evidence that the Jews ever mummified their dead. Okay, they, they did not, mummification involved evisceration and all kinds of processes. Uh, the, the word othonia, which means many cloths, is used, but it doesn't literally say strips of cloths of the same size. Okay, so that, that, that there was one translation that, that gave that impression. But we don't, we, the bodies of the people we do have from the first century show them in the position like we see the man in the shroud here. Um, the body, no, Antonacci believes that the body was unwashed. Okay, I disagree with that. And I think that there is good evidence that the body was not washed. Why do I say that? Because humans have a little thing called clotting. Okay? And when you have, let's say these, these wounds are from the whip marks, and I'll talk about those shortly. But, okay, you bleed after you get cut open, right? How long does it take for the blood to clot? Okay. Usually, within a couple hours, it's dry. All right. I mean, and so now here's somebody who was beaten, then crucified, left on the cross for several hours, taken down, and then marched several miles to a tomb. These that blood would be stone dry. Why are we seeing all this blood then? Now, if they got him to the tomb and then sh 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 washed him down, opening up these wounds again, now we can ooze something onto the cloth. That, that's the only thing that makes sense. It makes no sense if they, washed, if they didn't wash the body at all. This should all be clotted. It just fizz, unless the guy had hemophilia, I cannot get my head around the body not being washed. And people say that the body wasn't washed because they so, well, look at all that blood. How could they have washed it with all this blood on it? Doesn't make sense. Well, you know, if you wash all those clots off and you open up those wounds, you're going to get more blood. There's plenty to go around, okay? So it's, it's, it, there's, still enough, there's still enough there. I mean, if, if he had, if they, if he, if after they had beaten him like that and they had put in the cloth on him right away, there'd be a whole lot more blood than that. I mean, there's just, there's just enough blood there to make out the wounds. Okay, so yes, there's a lot of blood, but not nearly as much blood as there would be had they put it on when he was freshly wounded. Okay, and also you would not be able to see the detail of the wounds if they had, if, if they had washed, if they had not washed the body. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, uh, this is from a painting uh, that was, um, I forgot the name of the, the artist, um, but it shows them, uh, it's based on the Shroud of Turin, obviously, and it gives you some idea as to how, I think Descent from the Cross was the name of the, of the painting, and it shows you how the image, how the body was wrapped in the cloth. All right, now, people have been arguing that the Shroud was not authentic for years. In fact, there are two histories for the Shroud of Turin. We have the solid, uncontested history from 1300s on. We know exactly where it's been. It kept a diary all these years. And so that, that we, we know everywhere it's been. Every time I went to the bathroom, somebody was there with the camera, okay? Every, we know everything about that cloth from like the 1300s on. We have details. Before the 1300s, not so clear. We do have history, okay? We have, I think, some very good history, and we have some supporting evidence that the history we have is valid, but it is not as direct and clear as that that we have, that, that we have since the 1300s. But even if you go all the way back to the beginning of the 1300s, people were saying that it was a fake, okay? Uh, Pierre de Arcus was, um, one, was uh, the bishop, one of the, one of the bishop of Troyes, and he was very upset when, um, when uh, Geoffrey de Carney first uh, wanted to put the shroud out for exposition. Okay, he wanted to show the shroud and, I don't know, maybe get money for it. Um, and Pierre de Arcus, I don't know, he was like his pastor, and he felt, that, oh, no, he should go through me, maybe I want some of that cash. I don't know what his motivation was, okay? But anyway, Pierre de Arcus was so mad, he wrote a letter to the Pope and said that the shroud was a fake, and he knew the artist, and he knew how the artist had done it. Now, we don't know if he ever mailed that letter. We have no idea whether the Pope ever got it because if, even if he did mail the letter, the Pope ignored him because he allowed Jeffrey de Carney to display the shroud anyway. 
Okay. So I just want to mention here that, that th this thing has been contested for years. But even though it's been contested for years, it, it, it has been shown faithfully by the Catholic Church. Um, every 15 to 25 years, they bring it out. People come in. Um, people were touching it and worshiping it. And people were supposedly being healed by it and so forth and so on. I mean, that's the way it's been. And, but just the, up until 1898, the only people that were really into this were Catholics, pretty much. People outside the Catholic Church didn't even know about it, okay? I mean, most people didn't. Very, very few people outside the Catholic Church even knew that it existed. And then something happened. 1898, there was a fellow by the name of Sicando Pia, took the first photograph of the cloth. Now, to step back a bit, the Shroud of Turin is a very, very faint. Take a look at the image here. It, it, it's, it's a very faint sepia color, and it blends in to the cloth. If you stand right up close to the shroud, you can't see it. If you stand nose to nose, there's nothing there. If you step back a few inches, still nothing. You have to stand back a few feet before you can even see it. It's a very faint image. Now, when Pia took that first photograph of the cloth, he expected, you know, I'm taking a picture of a very faint image. It's kind of fuzzy. And what did he expect? Normally, when he took a photograph, he expected the negatives to look something unlike the image itself. Because, you know, hey, let's face it, when you take a picture of something and you look at the negative, the negative looks all funny. You know, you wonder, well, who is that? What is that? Because the negative looks strange, like you see here. But when he developed the picture, uh, you know, he didn't expect to see something that, to stand out at him that looks realer than the original image. And that's not what happened. When he looked at the uh, negative of the picture of the shroud, this is what he saw. Okay? Something that had positive characteristics. Something that looked very real. Something that looked very different than the negative. And what this demonstrates is that the Shroud of Turin has positive, the Shroud of Turin is a negative. Were it not a negative, you wouldn't see these positive characteristics stands out so clearly. And this is what sparked the scientific controversy. Scientists wanted to know, wait a minute. Okay, if we presume, like we have, that this was just another relic used for money, made by men, how in the world could a forger have created a perfect negative hundreds of years before the invention of photography? That's what got everybody else interested in it. Okay? That's what started everything. Here we see uh, the, the positive and the negative of the face side by side. And as you can see, there is a very big difference. You can see why they would say the shroud has to be a negative. It has to be a negative because otherwise, how can it stand out so clearly? Okay? Only a negative give, has, can give you positive characteristics like this. It's completely inverted. It's fo you know, photo inversion is what you call this. Where does photo inversion, how, how do you do that before the invention of photography? Okay. I'll, I'll just offhand, there was one um, uh, shroud uh, theorist who is a guy from Australia who believes that what happened was that a forger literally created a giant camera. And that's how he forged the shroud. He took a body, he invented the camera, and then he forgot what he did. And it just, <laughs> nobody, nobody can figure out. And he just kind of, we did a one-time deal. He invented a camera, and did the shroud thing, and then it just kind of went into you know, obscurity for several hundred years. So, Okay, today the shroud is kept in St. John's Cathedral in Turin, Italy. Uh, they keep it inside of a metal vault that is, uh, basically it's filled with nitrogen gas to prevent bacteria from eating the cloth. But not only is it filled with nitrogen gas, it is lined with thymol. Thymol is an organic poison and uh, that kills just about anything. So anything, you know, there's no bacteria can eat this cloth, no fungi can get a hold of it because it's lined with thymol. Now unfortunately for those who want to redate the shroud, that does create problems because thymol is an organic compound and it's contributing carbon atoms to the cloth. So if we want to date it again, we're going to have to find some other way to do it. There is another way to get around this, but um, we, it's, it's going to be difficult to take a sample from the cloth and get a, get a valid date um, because of thymol contamination. All right, now, in the old days, they used to let people touch the cloth when they put it out for exhibition every 15 to 25 years. Uh, there were some times when uh, they, they brought it outside for exposition, had a big picnic, and they brought the shroud out. See what we got, okay? And they didn't want it to flap in the wind. So what did they do to this 2,000-year-old cloth? They hung weights from the bottom of it to make sure that it didn't flap in the wind. 
If I had a hundred year old cloth, I don't think I would hang weights from the bottom of it. All right, now, as we get into the meat of the program here, uh, we're going to start with an overview of the anatomic and pathologic detail um, uh, concerning the shroud subject's body. And what we want to know is what we see in this body of this man who is in the shroud, does the condition of this body bear, bear uh, consistency with the condition of the body of Jesus of Nazareth as reported in the Gospels? Because one of the questions is, how do we know this is Jesus? I mean, seriously, of all the people in history, what makes us think that this is the Jesus of Nazareth? Okay, so that's the first thing we're going to look at. The second thing is we're going to take a look at our evidences of authenticity of the shroud as a first century Israeli burial cloth. If it doesn't date to the first century, if it's not consistent with first century, if it's not consistent with being in Israel, then it can't be, it can't be genuine, clearly. So does it, match, does it match up that? And the third thing we'll look at is uh, how was the image formed? How was the image formed? Uh, by what mechanism was it put on the cloth? Was it painted? Was it smeared? Was it radiated? Uh, what happened there? So that's the overview. So let's start out with the first part. Um, according to the New Testament, one time, uh, one night, Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, where he was with his disciples. Uh, Judas pointed him out to the guards. They came and arrested him. They brought him before the Sanhedrin, the Jewish High Council, and he was placed on trial for blasphemy. Now, there were a number of witnesses there that claimed he had done various crimes, but they couldn't quite agree on exactly what it was that he had done. And so finally, uh, Caiaphas, the high priest, comes out and says, okay, are you the Messiah? To which Jesus responds, I am. And that caused trouble because Caiaphas at that point got up, he tears his robe, he declares guilt Jesus as guilty right there of this horrible crime of blasphemy, and he is judged as deserving of death. Now the problem with making such uh, a judgment is that Israel at that time was under Roman occupation. In order to carry out a death sentence legally, you have to get the Romans to do it. Otherwise, it's called murder, <laughs> okay? All right, and you just don't want to make the Romans mad by doing murder, okay? So if you, want, if you don't want to get killed yourself, you better do it legally. And so they had to get the Romans to go along with this plan. So they bring Jesus before Pontius Pilate, the procurator, and uh, they present the problem to him. And he doesn't want anything to do with this problem. It's like, come on, and this is my problem, how? You know, this is a religious dispute. It's between you guys. Don't involve me. And so they were insistent. He didn't want to budge. And when he found out that Jesus was, uh, was a Galilean, uh, he said, well, wait a minute. Hold it. Galilee, that's not, my, that's not my county. That's not my jurisdiction. That's Wayne County. I'm Oakland County, okay? And so, he, you know, Herod, Herod was in town. And Herod was in, in the guy. He was in charge of Galilee, okay? That was his area. So since Herod was in town for the Passover festival, he sent him over to the hotel to see Herod, okay? And so off he went. He sent Jesus over to see Herod instead and let Herod judge him. Well, Herod had wanted to meet Jesus for some time. He'd heard the stories of his miracles, and he actually believed that Jesus may be John the Baptist risen from the dead, which worried him since he's the one that cut off his head. Okay, but anyway, um, that's what he thought. But he sees Jesus. He notices no resemblance. He, Jesus wouldn't do any miracles for him. He wouldn't speak to him. And so uh, Herod allowed Jesus to be roughed up a bit, but he couldn't find anything wrong with him. So he ends up sending him back to Pilate, unable to find him guilty of anything. Pilate still wants to let him go until the religious leader starts saying this man claims to be a king anyone who claims to be a king opposes caesar if you let this man go you are no friend of caesar's well Pilate was a friend of caesar that's how he got the job okay all right but he didn't want this news getting back because you know israel had, had lots of problems with zealots and sedition and if he if word got back that you know you could have done something about this little uprising and you did nothing. You know, he didn't want to look like he was sitting on his hands. So he goes, okay, okay, tell you what, I'll have him scourged. Now, that might sound like a nice compromise, but scourging was not a nice thing 
Okay, this scourging uh, was something to be fear, to be very much afraid of. If somebody said, "Oh, we're going to give you a little scourging," you know, you say, "Oh, that's okay." No, no, no. A scourging was a very, very scary and horrible thing. The first part of a scourging is where they take you out and they they hook you up to a little whipping post, and two centurions with flagra in their hands approach you. Now, if you look at Matthew twenty-seven twenty-six. It says that uh, in the New International Version, it says that uh, Pilate had Jesus flogged. In the New, New, New American Standard Bible, it says that he had Jesus scourged. And the New Living Translation, it says he ordered Jesus flogged with a lead-tipped whip. Actually, the latter is pretty correct. The word scourge is correct, and the lead-tipped whip as a description of that kind of scourge is correct as well. The Romans were known to have used when, when, uh, two types of scourge. Um, one had lead, lead, leaded tips, the other had bone, and then there's one with leaded tips and bone. So actually there were three, three, three types. There were three forms of corporal punishment that involved some type of beating uh, according to Roman history. The first one is fustigatio, fustigatio, which is a beating. So fustigatio, they beat you on the face with their fist, with sticks, whatever, but that's a fustigatio, you're getting a beating, okay? Not so bad. Because the next step up is flagellatio. Flagellatio is to be flogged. So that's where you're taking some device and you're going to be beaten black and blue because you're getting a good flogging and you're, you're not going to like it, okay? Uh, being flogged is like, is like, it's like what they did in the South. They'd give you a whipping, you know, and boom, boom, boom. That's a flogging. The third step is much worse, and that's vaberatio. Vaberatio is a severe flogging or a scourging. And for that, they use something like a cat of nine tails. And if you got verberatio, um, if you survived, according to the Roman, there was a Roman saying that says, if you survive verberatio, it's only because of the gods. Okay, uh, most people died. In fact, you were very often intended to die. They would literally dip their little cat of nine tails into sheep's blood so that it would be full of bacteria. So when they beat you with it, you would get infected and die after the event. Most people did die after being beat with these things. You died two to three days later from blood loss and from infection. Okay, as you can see here, the scourging was uh, usually done by one or two Roman centurions. The direction was uh, usually in a downward, uh, a downward direction. Yep, okay. Um, the, if you take a look at Horatio, he called it the horrible whip or the horrible scourge. Um, he says that sometimes it seems people were whipped to death. Um, you know, it's, this is really, uh, uh, this, is, this is Tacitus, the Roman historian. He mentions the death of Christ and he says, Nero, who, who uh, put those who commonly went by the name Christians to the most exquisite tortures, the author of this name was Christ, who was capitally punished in the reign of Tiberius by Pontius Pilate, the procurator. Okay, and Tacitus also talks about scourging a little bit. I thought that I had that slide here, but I guess not. Now, there were several forms of flagrum that we still have today. We've actually, you know, the Romans, we, throughout history, we've kept some of their tools, and so we, we actually have extant a number of these weapons. One, here's one where you see the, uh, the handle, which is a wooden handle, and then two leather straps with metal dumbbells that are parallel to the straps. Now here's another version where you see the handle and the le you have three leather straps and the metal dumbbells are parallel to the straps. And when you take a look at the back of the man in the shroud, we find 90 to 120 lashes with one of these types of scourges. This is called a type one scourge. Here we see a cartoon of it, but there you get the idea. Again, this is called a type one scourge and it makes specific types of marks. Um, Here's the, uh, the, the, the Roman sun god, Saul, on one of their coins, and notice that he's holding, he's holding a scourge in his hand. Now, this was basically, uh, this, this form of torture was reserved for, for definitely criminals. Uh, you weren't allowed to do this to a Roman citizen. Uh, it was something that you did to foreigners and to slaves. Josephus called it the most pitiable of deaths. Um, it was really, really a horrible way to go here.
Okay. Uh, Eusebius reports on uh, people who were scourged, some Christians who were scourged like this, and he says, their bodies were frightfully lacerated. Christian mar mar uh, martyrs in Smyrna were so torn by the scourges that their veins were laid bare and their inner muscles, sinews, even entrails were exposed. They literally had their guts whipped out. They were whipped down to where muscle was stripped away and you could see the, the bones and you could see, you could see joints even. So if you weren't careful with these things, you could easily disembowel your victims. Now here we have a paper by Barbara Fancini, and what she basically does is she looks at the, uh, the scourge marks that are found on the man in the shroud, and we see that he just wasn't beaten with the type 1 scourge uh, that I talked about uh, with the metal dumbbell tips. There were, th they were, called, there were actually three different types of weapon that were used based on the markings on the back of this man. Okay, here we see the type 1 scourge marks, and you see the metal dumbbells, and notice that the dump metal dumbbells that we have from this weapon, this Roman weapon that we have today, they fit the blood stains of the back of the man in the shroud perfectly. There are a total of 372 scourge marks on the back of this man, or on the body of this man, I should say, 159 on the front and 213 on the back. Now, these are blood marks that are specifically from the scourge, okay? 372 blood markings just from the scourging. That, now that does not include all the blood marks from the crown of thorns, from the wrist, or from the feet, or from the side. Altogether, there were well over 400 individual blood marks on this cloth, but 372 from the flagra. And here you see where the, the computer has highlighted all of them. And lo, some of these you can't see with the naked eye, and so the, you had to basically use special photography to, to, uh, to, to, to make this out. All right, and again, this whole body washing thing, I mentioned earlier that in order for, if they didn't wash the body, you would not be able to see the detail on these scourges that you're able to see. Here we see the type 1 scourge marks. You see that some of them had two dumbbells in the leaded tip. Some had three, as you can see here. All right, and that's just um, Giuseppe Enri's photograph, and they did the three-dimensional analysis, so you can see the scourge markings kind of stand out on the back of this guy. And here you see um, the other types of flagra that were used. Uh, they probably they look like they were either ropes or reeds, and so they weren't the leaded tip ones. Now, why use these milder versions? The man in the shroud, they, if, if the man in the shroud is Jesus of Nazareth, they didn't want him dead. They didn't tell him to kill him. Okay, they were going to bring him back in. If you beat this person all up and down with the flagra taxillate and with that metal one, and you do it very hard, when you get down in the legs and the back of the legs, you're going to hit veins. You're going to hit important, important things, and the guy could bleed to death. And so they had this other weapon so they can thoroughly beat him all over his body without killing him. Remember, he was going back to Pilate. You know, Pilate's going to scourge him and let him go. That was the idea. So the intention was not to kill him. And so they, they, they got him with the flagra. They did the horrible scourge, but in addition, they, they got in their beatings with other weapons as well that weren't quite as lethal. All right. So the historical records describe how this is done. Usually two of them, one on each side, and they would strike in downward strokes. And Josephus reported that many, uh, there were several rebel Jews that were literally torn to pieces with this. I mean, this is like, this is like, this is, this is like a meat tenderizer. And you can see how this could, this could, this could, this could tear you to pieces. It's not, you know, it's not the, um, you know, we, you know, that movie, The Passion, you know, where they use the bone, and, you know, the, you know a lot of people, and myself, and I criticized it very strongly. I said, you know, if they do something like that, the guy would be dead. There's, you're, not, you, you, you're ripping down to the muscle. You know, by the time you get to the cross, you're, you're going you're gonna to run out of blood. <laughs> okay. okay? And the people who beat this man in the shroud didn't strip this flesh off with that type of weapon. They used the leaded tip one and the lighter weapon, leaving, you know, so this person is not going to be uh, he's not going to be bled before he can uh, undergo other tortures. So here we see the back of the man in the shroud. Um, you see, this, this weapon, these this flagra markings are present all up and down this man's back. I mean, all up and down his back, you can see these markings. And uh, you, you also, I, I did a highlight of the back of the hair where you can see the pig, the, the, the area where the, the, the circled area is where the pigtail was, by the way. Okay, here we see a drawing where all of the flagra markings. So as you can see, uh, got him in the shoulder area all the way down to the back of his legs, all the way down to where his feet are. Now, 
the, in, they uh, were very aggressive so that the weapon not only struck him in the back, but also it wrapped around and dug into his chest and his thighs as well. Okay, now that's very important later on uh, when we talk about the spear wound. You want to keep in mind that these, these, are, these brutal markings uh, were applied to his chest as well because that's going to have pulmonary consequences later on. Now, when you look at a movie where Jesus is beaten like this, or even this model, this, this particular model was based on the man in the shroud. And I would say that's not accurate. That's not how he would have looked. And yes, even though it's based on the shroud, the, the, in reality, you would, there would not be any light-colored skin showing. The, the bruising that would take place would be massive. He would be black and blue. I mean, there would be so much bruising that would take place. I mean, he's been beaten like hamburger here, okay? You're not going to have clear white skin showing through. He would be beaten black and blue and very bloody. This is a very, very gruesome, very gruesome attack. Okay. Now, the next part here, we're going to talk about the crown of thorns. This is, uh, you know, this is a very, very important segment. The Bible says after they finished be flogging him or scourging him, they jammed a crown of thorns on his head. Now, when you take a look at the head of the man in the shroud, what you don't see is this neat circlet of thorns, like you see in movie, in this particular movie where they have this neat circlet of thorns. Do you really think the soldier said, hey, let's make a crown. I know how to do it. Let's, you know, seriously, they grabbed some thorns and jammed them on his head, okay? They didn't spend time weaving a, a thorn. And why did they do that? Well, why did they put the crown of thorns on his head? Okay? The lictors, as, as the people who are responsible for the torture before the execution, they want to know, why are we killing this person? I'm, I'm a psychiatrist, and I've treated, I've been in the prison system, with the VA system, I, I've, I've treated a lot of people, include a lot of drug dealers and murderers. And, you know, when I'm talking to these people, one thing I notice is that everybody wants to think that they're a good person. We all have that. You know, we might do horrible things, but you know what? I don't sell drugs to people under 18. I only kill bad people. I don't sell the hard drugs. You know, I'm, you know we always have a good reason for what we do, okay? We always have a good reason. And when these soldiers are working out on these people, they want to know, well, what, what was the crime? They always want to know what's the crime. Why are we beating this guy? And then they would taunt them. And we know that from historical records. They did that. They would taunt them. You, you bad person. You robbed that old lady. Or you, you, you know, you robbed the liquor store. Well, maybe not that many. You, you killed somebody. And, and they, they, they wanted to feel like we're the good guys. We're going to beat you because you're bad. You're a bad person. And so they asked Jesus of Nazareth comes along, and they want to know, what did he do? King of the Jews. King of the Jews. That's a new one. Okay, king of the Jews. What do we do about that? How are we going to taunt him for that? And so that's where they idea, well, king of the Jews, let's do the king thing, right? So they grabbed the crown of thorns down on his head because that was the charge, king of the Jews. Right? So we take a look at the man in the shroud. He's got many wounds. Now, originally, if you, if you, if you just look at the, 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 the photographs of the naked eye, you can see 12 copious, distinct wounds surrounding the entire cap of the skull, okay? Instead of this circlet, just, they're, they, they're all over. But close up, uh, you realize that there are actually 30 scalp lacerations altogether. And even in, the, in this particular area, when they took the sticky tape samples and they, they picked up the pollens and the fibers of the cloth, also they found wood, wood fibrils as well that, are, that appear to be oak. Okay, so that's actually in, in, that, in, that, in, in the head region there. Okay? And so this is more, more what it looks like. Now, when you consider the location of where this took place, the, there, it is likely that these were thorns of the genus Sisyphus spina, the common lote bush. And they have very sharp thorns, and they would bite into the scalp. And the scalp would bleed quite freely. The scalp has a lot, a lot of blood vessels. I remember one of my first, um, when I was in radiology, um, I, did a, I did a project at University of Michigan, and we were looking at causes of voodoo death. This is totally a tangent, isn't it? Anyway, but I remember in, in looking, we wanted to know why people die when they get curses. We, you know, we were looking for a mechanism. We were thinking that there was something called contraction band myocytolysis. When you are scared to death, what happens is the insular cortex will cause hyperexcitation of the heart. It will cause massive amounts of adrenaline to be released on the cardiac muscle, causing the actin and myosin filaments to come together and to lock. 
and so you end up dying from that. It's, it's a different type of heart attack than the regular heart attack from a, from a thrombosis, okay, from a regular heart attack. It's not that kind of a heart attack, but you're literally scared to death. So that was one of the theories. Now, I remember one of the subjects in the study had died because he was in a bank, and during the robbery, one of the robbers had stabbed him in the head, and he bled so much that he died from all the blood. Okay, because the scalp bleeds a lot. That there's a lot of blood vessels in the scalp. It bleeds very copiously. And so that's what we see on the head of this man. There is a lot of blood there. Okay, now here you see the, uh, these, this, this shot was designed to, to highlight the, uh, some of the blood there, and it was all over the place. Now, what is interesting, what is interesting about the flow of the blood, and it even changes as, as it meets an obstruction, it actually changes flow and everything. It flows just like a, a, like a, like a, real, like a real bleeding. Why this is important is that there were a lot of people throughout history that were crucified, a lot of people that were beaten with the flagra, a lot of people got nails in their bodies. Only one person in history received a crown of thorns. Nobody else. There's nobody else in all of history that received a crown of thorns. It was a spurious, spur-of-the-moment deal. And that is important because to those who hold the opinion that, you know, it's, yeah, it's a shroud, probably it has a dead person in it, but who knows who that is? You're like, wait a minute, hold it, hold it, hold it. All right, the crown of thorns, really? Okay, I mean, what that says to us, and this is one of those common sense type of deals, but what this tells us is that either this is the real deal, this is Jesus of Nazareth, or this is a forger. This is definitely a forgery, and the forger really intends us to believe that this is Jesus of Nazareth. The chance that this could be some other very unlucky poor guy who just happened to get scourged and crucified and get the crown, the chance of that is just, that's very remote. Now, could he have been shot in the head with a BB gun many times? Yeah, whatever. Oh, no. I mean, I mean you, could, you could go out there, and well, aliens could have done it too, okay? I mean, just from a, from a, from a logical perspective, it, it strongly suggests that, okay, if this is a forgery, our forger really wants you, you to believe that this is Jesus of Nazareth. Now, also, in the Bible, it is described, you know, it, it actually, the, the terminology used to describe the crown of thorns is a cap of thorns. It actually says that. But, you know, in many translations, it doesn't come out that way. Okay, so again, our forager knew not to make a little circlet of thorns, like, like in the artwork. He didn't do the art thing. He put the whole cap on there. All right? So, pretty smart person. And as I mentioned, the crown of thorns was a spurious action unique to Jesus mocked for being king. Now, next the Bible describes how the soldiers took turns beating Jesus in the face. They had a game that was called Basilinda. And in Basilinda, the soldiers would blindfold you, then beat you. And then they'd say, guess which one of us did? If you guess right, we'll stop. Okay? Now, they cheated sometimes, I imagine. But anyway, he was also beaten by the temple guards. Before he went in to see the high council, he was beaten in the face as well. So he's undergone a significant amount of beating. And when we take a look at the face of the man in the shroud, we find a swollen, perhaps broken nose. And some people say, wait a minute, a broken nose? That's a broken bone? No, cartilage. Cartilage is displaced. We call that a broken nose. Uh, it's not really broken bone, though. But yeah, we, it does appear to be evidence of a, of, a, of a broken nose. Swelling over both eyes and a swollen left cheek. Now, after this beating, he's brought back before Pilate, and uh, he's looking very bad now. I mean, he's gone through this horrific process. He's lost a lot of blood. He's in a tremendous amount of pain, and he's brought back before Pilate, and Pilate is still trying to let him go. And so he says, you know what? He's, he's still he's going to do the passive-aggressive thing. So I'm not going to do what you religious leaders tell me. I'm going to let the people decide, because he's thinking, you know, these guys are jealous because Jesus is very popular. And he says, you know what, I'm, I, yeah, I'm not going to let you crucify him out of jealousy. I'm going to give the people that love him so much, I'm going to give them the opportunity to, 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 to save this guy. And so he gave him a choice. I'm going to let one of these people go on Passover, Jesus or Barabbas. Which one do you want? And the crowd yells, crucify Jesus, you release Barabbas. And so Jesus is therefore led off to be crucified. Pilate washed his hands of the thing, says, okay, it's, his blood's on your, on your hands, I'm, I'm done. And Jesus is led away for the crucifixion process. And the first part of this crucifixion process is where he is forced to carry a cross piece up the Via Della Rosa. All right? Now, the Via Della Rosa is not very long, but it's kind of steep. 
Okay, do you really want to carry a 100 pound cross piece on your back up something that's that steep? As you go up right below the hair in the area of the shoulder blades, notice how it's very dark. Okay, what we see is you have blood markings from the metal flagra, but also you have more blood distributed that's outside of the dumbbell markings. It's like that part of the back has been rubbed raw. It becomes a lot more like hamburger. So in addition to the flagra blood, you have other blood that's outside of that distribution. Okay, so that is evidence of where that heavy uh, cross piece called the patibulum rubbed the back, rubbed the shoulder blades raw. You know, can imagine carrying, you know, it's, it's as though it was carried in this fashion up there. Now, after being beaten to, to, to that degree, it would be very hard to make it all the way up there. Now, Matthew, Mark, and Luke describe Jesus as carrying his cross up that hill. But John reports that Simon of Cyrene was forced to carry that cross. Jesus didn't make it. And so tradition says he started out, but he fell several times on the way up. And so that's when they made Simon of Cyrene carry the cross instead. Okay, and we look at the, um, at the, at the knees of the man in the shroud, we do find uh, a laceration and scoriations suggesting that a possible fall there. So next, we have the actual crucifixion. Art and movies most often portray the nails of crucifixion as going into the palms, right through, straight through, boom. That's how it's normally portrayed. However, Experiments done by Dr. Pierre Barbet in the 1930s demonstrated that it's impossible to crucify people through the palms if you go straight through. Okay? Now, Barbet, you know, I read his book. He was one of the first books that I read. And I have to say, uh, you know, he, he, he looks like a Pierre, doesn't he? Okay? <laughs> but, you know, he did these experiments. That he was the Surgeon General of St. Joseph's Hospital, right, in, in Paris, France. And boy, did he have a lot of power, way more power than doctors do today. I can't take cadavers. I can't, take, I can't go down to the morgue, grab a body, and crucify it like he did, all right? And he did that. He, he literally did that. He actually took cadavers from the hospital morgue and crucified them and took pictures of them, okay, to prove that you can't crucify people through the... Now, he didn't do it to everybody, only to people where they didn't claim the body. If nobody claimed the body, only then would he do that. And then some of them, after he, after he did that, what he did was he took um, the arms of, like, like, the war was going on at that time back in the 30s, and so when people got killed, he would sometimes saw off the arms and hang a weight of 88 pounds from the dismembered portion, and they would nail them to the wall, seeing how long they, before they come off. And that's how he proved that you can't nail people up by going straight through the palm, because there's nothing here to hold it onto the cross. They, go, they would fall off every time. Okay, now he postulated that, there, that, that, that clearly they would have to go through the wrist. In order to stay on the cross, you would have to put the nail through the wrist. And when you look at the shroud, that's what you see. The blood wounds appear to be in the wrist area. Now, when Barbet drove nails through the wrist, what would happen is it would graze across the median nerve, which is in the center of the hand there, and when it went through that, the median nerve, it would cause contraction of the thenar muscles and the thumb would flick inward. And so he looked at the back of the shroud and said, ah, there are no thumbs present, and that proves that the nail went in the wrist. Now, also, he mentioned accurately that when you drive a nail through the wrist and you hit that median nerve, that causes an excruciating amount of pain, okay? You know where you get the word excruciating from? Crucifixion. That's where it comes from. This was designed to be a horrible torture. The Persians invented crucifixions. The Romans perfected it, all right? They did it. The Romans did more crucifixions than anybody in history, all right? They perfected it, and it was designed to be a horrible, brutal, agonizing torture. And when you have a nail grinding against the median nerve, you know, some people say, well, you know, it's, it's not that bad. Why do you want to make Jesus sound like he suffered so much? It's a, I mean, come on, what's the big deal? The big deal <laughs> okay, if you take a look, you ever know what a, the brain homunculus is? You ever seen the, 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 homo, the homunculus is a map of the brain showing you how much of the brain is devoted to a particular area of the brain. Okay, if you take a look at your back, for example, it's a teeny, teeny, you gotta, your back takes up a lot of surface area, but when you take a look at the nerves that are devoted to your back, only a teeny little part of your brain is devoted to it. Okay, so even though your back is a big structure, only a little bit of your brain is devoted to back. Your, your hands, that's huge. Your tongue, 
huge. Lips, huge. These are sensitive parts to your body. The median nerve has sensory data for your hands. I mean, come on, that's a lot of sensory. And when you have a nail grinding against that kind of a nerve, that's very, very severe. That's severe pain. And it's designed for that. That's why it's a torture. That's why they have the word excruciating. You are in, you are, you are being tortured. Now, Dr. z u g a b y here disagrees with Dr. Barbet. And z u g a b y has some good points, I have to say. Uh, z u g a b y says, no, Barbet was wrong. And actually, I think he, I think he was right. Uh, z u g a b y was the medical examiner in New York. He set up the medical examiner system for Rockland County, New York in 69. And he served it for 33 years until he retired in 2002. He's got a PhD and an MD. And z u g a b y noted in 1994, z u g a b y had a case of a woman who was murdered. Um, she was brutally stabbed to death multiple times. And um, in the process of her being killed, she tried to protect herself by putting her hand in front of her face. When she did, the attacker came down and stabbed her right here, okay? Now, if you take your thumb and you touch your little finger, that furrow is called the t h e n a r furrow right here. Now, when he stabbed her, that na- that, the, the knife went from the, from the palm here out the back of her wrist. And he said, whoa, wait a minute. z u g a b y was very excited about that because, okay, that's actually her hand, by the way. Okay, um, here it is going through the front, and that's where it came out in the back. And what he k n o w s he says, wait a minute, that's exactly where the wound is on the man in the shroud. Okay? Now, when you look at that area, it turns out that the, the, a, a wound that goes... into the, 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 the thenar furrow there, what it, ha, what it, uh, it is guided by, two, by several bones, by the, metacarp- by, the first, uh, by the metacarpal bone to the index finger and by two carpal bones, and it comes out of an area called the Z area. It doesn't have to break any bones, but it's a natural furrow in the hand. It goes in the front and out the back in the wrist area. And so what, that, so what you're looking at on the shroud, what you're looking at here, this is an exit wound. This is an exit wound. So the exit wound is in the wrist, but the entrance wound is in the palm, the lower part of the palm right here. Okay? Does that make sense? All right. Now, um, here's a picture of the woman's hand again. So if you're squeamish, you might want to look at this. (laughs) Okay. But here she goes. What he did was he took a large needle and he put it through the knife wound. And so, again, through the palm in the front, out the wrist in the back, exactly in the area of the man in the shroud. And here's Dr. z u g a b y The most dramatic marks on the image indicate that the man was then nailed to a cross. The Shroud of Turin shows the wound in the wrist area on the back of the hand. If the nail went through here, at the base of the thumb region here, it would emerge exactly where the Shroud of Turin shows it and would be in an extremely firm place that would hold several hundred pounds. According to z u g a b y the nail would have struck the most sensitive nerves in the body. It damages the median nerve, causing the person to have a condition called causalgia, one of the worst pains ever experienced by man. It's like lightning bolts traversing the arm. The pains are brutal. Could send a person okay. into... Sh- you get the idea. This is a form of torture that is pretty diabolical. Um, the amount... Uh, the, the paint, the, the nails that were used for crucifixion were not those little nails that you get down at the Ace Hardware. These were like railroad spikes. Okay? So you don't accidentally fall off when you, when you have nails of this size. Now, do we have any other bodies of crucified people? Very few. You know, that was a long time ago. So even though we have much literature on people that were crucified, we don't have a lot of bodies. We have the body. In 1968, Israeli bulldozers uncovered the the bodies of about 70 people who died between the years 1 and 70 AD. The body of most interest to us was of a guy by the name of Johanan. We know his name because that was the name on his bone box. And in looking at Johanan's bones, we discovered that this is the manner in which he was crucified. Um, The nails went through his feet, as you see here, and they put the nails straight through the wrist. 
So with the man in the shroud, it appears to have gone like into the palm area and then coming out in the carpal bone area. And this guy, they went right through his wrist. Now here's the, this is the bone stuck in his heel bone. That's the nail stuck in his heel bone there. And here we see the wound uh, where, uh, uh, if you take a look at the, at the, at the radius, um, at the top bone there, there's a little white notch. That's where the bone went through on Johanan. So they went right through this guy's wrist to hold him on the cross. Sometimes, you know, with the, the Romans, they crucified a lot of people. And so they didn't always do it the exact same way, apparently. Now, this is what, this is what the cross entails. There are pieces to the cross. The patibulum is the part that you, are, that you are nailed to, that your hands are nailed to. That's the cross piece at the top. You have the stipes, which is the up and down portion. And sometimes they give you a subtle... Uh, to stand on. And then there's the titulus, which is the title. That's what describes what your crime is. All right. Next, we have the, the nails of the feet. Okay. Uh, apparently, it uh, looks like the one foot was nailed down lightly to the cross, and the other foot was placed over it, and a, and a large nail was driven clean through both. Or um, one nail may have been used to, to, to do both of them. The nail on the man in the shroud went between the third and fourth metatarsal bones, Right below, right below the Les Frank joint. Okay, now, death by crucifixion. What does that entail? How do people die when they're on a cross? That's not entirely clear. Uh, we do have some good evidence as to what might be happening, though. We do know that uh, both in World War I and World War II, the Germans employed a method of torture called Aufbinden. And in Aufbinden, what they did was they would take people and they would hang them up as you see here, with their feet just dangling off the ground. And in this process, um, people would die of suffocation very, very slowly. What happens is as you go above the head, every time you go ab ab above the heart, the perfusion pressure drops. And if you stay up there for a long time, pretty soon you don't have enough perfusion pressure to get enough blood and oxygen to the distal parts of your, of your hand. And so if you don't have enough blood, oxygen, glucose and oxygen, then your calcium bumps fail and you end up with tetanus. And so tetanus starts in the hands, then it goes into the forearms, then the biceps, then the chest and respiratory muscles. So what would happen, these individuals that have the ability to breathe in, but they couldn't breathe out. And so as a result, they would die of suffocation, but it was very painful, but that's, that's what they did, okay? And in crucifixion, the idea is that in hanging in that crucified position, something very similar would happen. And so the person on the cross would be constantly pushing up and down and up and down and up and down, and every, they, would, they would push up to, to get a breath, because when they would sag down, they would get this, this asphyxia, this paralysis of the respiratory muscles, so that they had to push up on the nails in their feet in order to get a breath. And we take a look at the blood flowing from the man's wrist. It does appear to flow at two different angles at 55 and 65 degrees, which may have corresponded to the two positions that he took on the cross. But, you know, that may or may not be what happened. Zugaby did some experiments to see if that was true. And he literally got people to volunteer to see how long they could stay on the cross. And he got people to volunteer for five to 45 minutes and then he said, are you having trouble breathing? And they said, no. And some people lasted as long as 45 minutes. But they all came down because of cramping in their arms and, and shoulders. And I have a problem with this. And I'm going, wait a minute. They didn't crucify people for 45 minutes. So that really doesn't, you know, because he was trying to say that's not how it works. I kind of disagree with him because um, 45 minutes is not really long enough to say definitively that that doesn't work. And we know that people did die that way. Can we take a look at the body of Johanna? Not only do we have the nail wounds in the wrist area and not in the area of the palms, but we have a person with nails in the feet. Now, the nails in his feet were in the calcaneus. Literally, it went through the side of his heel bone, as you can see in this slide. Now, uh, Johanna's legs were broken, and they found his leg bones in pieces. And the question is, why would they break the legs of somebody who's on the cross? Why do crucifixion victims get broken legs? Several reasons. One is if, you, if, if death by crucifixion is related to death by asphyxiation, and there is some evidence that asphyxiation is involved in the death process, then when your legs are broken, you're no longer able to push up on the nails in your feet, and you then stay down and die of suffocation. Additionally, when they break the legs, uh, when you 
break bones that big, like the femur, you're going to release marrow, you're going to get what we call a fat embolism. Chunks of that marrow come out, they get into the blood, and they travel to the heart, and you end up dying from that. Okay, it's called a fat embolism. Now the other reason why you might want to break the legs is if you're trying to speed the process up and you want to make sure that your patient is dead, not your patient, <laughs> your victim is dead, if you want to make sure that they're dead, then you break the legs. So even if, you, even if they come down off the cross, they're not getting very far. If you break their legs traumatically like that, um, they're not going to crawl away and the animals will probably get them. So there are a number of reasons why when you're ready for the crucifixion to be over, you go ahead and break the legs. But when you take a look, at the body of Jesus, we find that that is not what happened. Uh, this is John chapter 19, verses 31. It says here, Now it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jews did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus, they found that he was already dead they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with the spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. Then we take a look at the body of the man in the shroud. We find no evidence of broken bones. Specifically, there are no broken legs here. But we do find a neat elliptical wound in his side that would fit a spear rather nicely. Now, not just any spear, but I'll get to that. Here we see the ultraviolet fluorescence picture of the shroud next to of the, of the, of the side wound as well as uh, a black and white photo of the, of, the, of the spear wound. And what we notice here is that the, the wound itself is kind of like a, shaped like a club frank at the top there. And then from that wound you see flowing the blood and then the water. Now you don't really see any water in the black and white photo. If you look at the UV fluorescence shot, look at the material that is glowing white. The glowing white material, uh, you can only see that under UV fluorescence, that is serum. And it is very rich in serum albumin. Okay, and that's why you see this heavy UV fluorescence. And so that's what you're looking at. You can't see the serum component in the, fit, in the photograph. You can't look at the shroud and see the serum component. You have to, you have to use UV fluorescence to make that out. And so that's, that's very interesting that you can actually make out when John describes the blood and water coming out of Jesus' side, you can see, you can observe this phenomenon on the cloth. All right? Now, here we see another shot, and it's, the blood shows up green here. Uh, but again, the very top of the area would be the, the wound itself, the spear wound itself, and then the blood and water coming out of that. Now, what's interesting about that hot dog-shaped wound here, um, this is closer to me here. Okay, here we see the side wound. Here you see the spear wound itself, and then the, the blood and water coming out. Uh, it would show up better on the non-negative version, but that's what I've got here. Um, this wound fits only one particular Roman spear. The Romans were known to have used four different kinds of spears during their reign. Um, the hosta, the hosta velitaris, the pilum, and the lancia. Now, it wasn't always that way. Early on, when Julius Caesar first started his conquest of the barbarian nations and his forces went out to conquer them, uh, they brought spears with them. And they brought these nice javelins, and they had these beautiful thick tips on and everything, and they would throw them at their enemies. And guess what would happen? Their enemies would pick them up and throw them back. And what they found was that they were funding the military of the opposition. And so they said, you know, this is a problem because, you know, like, if we miss, we're going to get it back. And if we get them, they're going to pull it out, and we're going to get it back. And so, like, we're paying for their weapons. And that doesn't make any sense. And so one uh, very bright Roman scientist said, you know what, I've got an idea. Instead of making our spears so that they can be reused, let's make them disposable. And so what they did was they put these heads on them that were very thin. So instead of being like um, Indian, instead of being like, like wide, they were like Indian arrowheads and they had, their, and, 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 and like uh, toothpicks, not toothpicks, ice picks. And right near the tip, it was real thin, okay, right near the, the actual point, it was thin. And so the shaft got narrow here, and so that when you throw it at your enemy and it hits them, it breaks. Once it penetrates, it's like, it's, it's, like the, it, it's so weak here that it breaks. And if it falls to the ground, snap, it breaks. So now they've got a stick, but they can't throw it back as a spear. 
Now the hosta, the hosta velitaris, were these disposable war spears. As you can see here, the tips were rather thin, kind of like Indian arrowheads there. And, uh, and th th those, were, those were the main uh, spears that they used in battle. The other spear, the lancia, was different. Okay, the lancia spear was, uh, is, like, you got one of those. It was standard issue for the military garrisons guarding Jerusalem. In fact, many of the garrisons, that was standard issues. This is like, you have a sword and you have your spear. It's the one spear. It's not meant for battle. It's meant for poking your enemies, riot control. Okay, you kept it with you. You got your name on it. It's yours. Don't throw it away. It's called the lancia. Now, we have examples of all these spears today. Here's an example of the lancia. Notice that the, the tip is very broad. It's much bigger than what you see with the hosta, the hosta velitaris, and the pilum. Now, we have examples of the lancia spear today. We can measure the dimensions of that wound, we, of, that, of that spear tip, and we know what dimensions it makes when it penetrates. We can measure that, and it just so happens that the spear wound on the man in the shroud corresponds to the width of a wound made by a lancia type spear. But I go further, say, well, that's nice. Well, it, 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 what, what's even more important is that in the New Testament, when they describe, when John describes the spear that was thrust into Jesus' side, he doesn't use the generic word for spear. He uses the Greek word lanka. Lanka is Greek for the Latin word lancia. So we have in the Greek New Testament a description of the actual spear that was used to poke Jesus in the side. We have examples of that spear and the dimensions of that spear fit this hole and it doesn't fit any of those other spears. Okay. Now how do you get blood and water from a, a side wound like this? The most well-formulated hypothesis was put forth by Dr. Anthony Saba, who's a cardiothoracic surgeon. Saba noted from his own surgical experiences, as well as from a questionnaire he took among other thoracic surgeons, that whenever you get severe violence to the rib cage without any open wound, there often results in accumulation of bloody fluid in the pleural cavity. In other words, if you get beat up on your chest really hard, like hit by a car or something like that, and what happens is that energy is transmitted into your pleural sac, okay? There's a sac that is like, right, if you go from your lungs out, you got that pleural sac, and there's fluid between the lungs and the chest wall, and that's that pleural. Anyway, that, that energy is transmitted into the pleural sac, and it, you rupture those capillaries in there, and you end up with this bloody fluid that accumulates in the pleural sac. Okay, it fills up with this bloody material and it blub, 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 and it fills up and fills up, and your lung, it's getting hard to breathe because your lung's swimming in this bloody fluid, okay? Now, when the, when the person, now, in, in the person, the man in the shroud, remember, was beaten in the chest quite aggressively with the flagrum. Would that be enough? You bet. <laughs> that would definitely be enough trauma to cause this accumulation of bloody flu fluid in the pleural cavity. So then, um, when you get this accumulation of fluid, as, as because it's not being circulated, eventually it separates into a heavy dark cellular layer because of gravity and a lighter serous fluid above. Okay, um, let's take a look at this next slide. Here we go. Okay, so there you see the, the lung collapsing under the, under, the, under the water, under this bloody fluid, and then you see it separating out, so you see the lighter serous fluid above and the uh, bloody layer below. So that when you stick a spear, into that side, what happens is the first, the heavy dark cellular material globs down to the level of the wound, and then what follows is the lighter serous fluid. So first, blood, the heavy dark stuff, and then later, the water that John describes, okay? Now, we take a look at the back of the man in the shroud. Um, we notice that there is post-mortem pooling of the blood. It's like when they took him off the cross and laid him on this cloth, then what happens is the blood comes out of that spear wound and gathers in the small of his back, as you can see here. Now, when you take a look at the blood, the blood has been analyzed extensively, and it is human blood, uh, AB, type AB, and um, also very high in bilirubin. And bilirubin is consistent with severe concussive beating. Whenever you have lots of beating, like we see in the man in the shroud, uh, you're going to see a lot of hemolysis. And that's what we see evidence of that in this man, in, this, in the blood of this man on the shroud. So think about it. If this is a forgery, 
Think about what our forger would have need, needed to have known. You almost have to come to the idea that he really killed somebody. Because if this thing was created in the, in the medieval period, people weren't crucifying people during the, in the 12th century. That, that, that had gone a long time ago. So this person murdered something. It appears that he, mur he actually murdered somebody to do this. Or he just really did his homework, <laughs> okay, and made sure that he got everything just as it needed to be. Uh, he needed to know that in a real scourge victim uh, that the blood would be high in bilirubin, and so he used blood that would meet that criteria to understand that when you lay the body on the cloth that there would be blood coming out of that spear wound that would gather in the small of the back so you'd see that post-mortem blood pooling. He'd have to know the approximate dimensions of the lancia-type spear, okay, uh, so that it's consistent with the Bible's description of the Lanka spear that the, he'd know that the nails in the crucifixion, the exit wound, would come out of the wrist and not the, not the center of the palms in order for the person to stay on the cross. Um, he would have to know about the, the, the up-down goniom up goniometry of the blood flows coming out of the wrist co corresponding to the two positions the individual would assume on the cross, that the, cap of that, the, that the crown of thorns did not refer to a circlet but to a cap of thorns and the dimensions of, uh, the, dimensions and of the dumbbell markings consistent with the flagrum taxillatum. These are all things that our forger would need to take into consideration. And if this is a forgery, that is indeed what our forger has done. Okay? So that's, as far as the anatomic uh, correlates, they're, they're, pretty, they're pretty interesting. It's difficult to imagine somebody doing this with a model. Uh, physicians who have examined the man in the shroud, these images have pretty much been universally convinced that this cloth did at one time contain a body, and that body suffered death by crucifixion. Okay? Thank you.